my, you know, my beautiful, my loving, my loyal wife, Christine, and my children, and my grandson, and also for the United States government. I have been held here for three and a half years. I am not in very good health. I am running very quickly out of diabetes medicine. I have been treated well, but I need the help of the United States government to answer the requests of the group that has held me for three and a half years. And please help me get home. 33 years of service to the United States deserves something. Please help me. Welcome to Unresolved. I am your host, Michael Whelan. This episode is a far cry from my usual subject matter. While I usually focus on small town murder mysteries, this story includes a much larger scale and plays out almost like a modern day spy drama. However, before I get into the story, I just want to let you know how you can help support this show. You can head to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod to become a patron. There, you could get access to all kinds of perks, such as bonus mini-episodes, commercial-free episodes, and coming soon, a brand new podcast series made exclusively for Patreon supporters. That show will be just like this one, but will feature resolved cases, so you'll get to learn about culprits, court cases, and all the jazz that I never get to cover on this program. Once again, that'll be at patreon.com slash unresolvedpod, and I'll have more information in the very near future. If you would like to learn more about the podcast, either listen through to the close of this episode, or visit our website, which is unresolved.me. Now, without any further ado, here is the story of Robert Levinson. Robert Allen Levinson was born on March 10th, 1948, in the Flushing neighborhood of Queens, New York. Unfortunately, not much about Robert's early life is public knowledge. Bob, as he is known among friends and family, would work for three large government entities. The Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, over a 30-year career. Because of that, not much of Robert's personal life is public knowledge. However, based on his career, and some personal details, we can surmise some of Robert's personality. We know that Robert attended New York University and eventually obtained a BA degree from the City College of New York in 1970. At around the same time, he married his high school sweetheart, a young woman named Christine Gorman, who remains married to Robert to this day. Together, they would have seven children, Douglas, Samantha, David, Daniel, Sarah, Stephanie, and Susan. Following his collegiate career, Robert Levinson went right to work with the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, where he would work for six years, before moving on to the organization where he would spend the bulk of his career, the FBI. At the FBI, Robert Levinson specialized in organized crime, in particular, crimes related to money laundering. He reportedly loved his work, as he spent the vast majority of his time being a people person, going out and making connections, that kind of thing. He was well known for developing informants, and his former co-workers described him as a gregarious good cop. While working in New York, he had become an expert on the region's five mob boss families. But after working up some clout in his field, he put in for a transfer to the Miami field office. There, he began taking on Russian organized crime, tracking mobsters and scammers that were buying up real estate and establishing drug empires through the 1980s and 1990s. In 1998, after 20 some odd years with the Bureau, Bob Levinson announced his retirement. Colleagues state that the only reason he retired was because he could earn more money in the private sector, and with seven kids now approaching college age, he needed all of the help he could get. He would spend the next decade working as a private investigator, but Bob allegedly missed the action of working for a three-letter agency. Those that knew him said he always regretted his decision to retire, and going into the mid-2000s, he was anxious to get back into the game. In 
In June of 2006, Robert Levinson was quickly approaching 60 years old. He was slightly overweight with gray hair that was bordering on white. He wore large, grandfatherly glasses, which almost looked like bifocals. And he was rocking a salt and pepper flaked chevron mustache. He had also been diagnosed as a diabetic and had some brief struggles with other conditions, such as high blood pressure and gout. Needless to say, he was not what you would imagine a spy to be. But that did not stop Bob Levinson from wanting to get back into law enforcement. Perhaps even into covert intelligence gathering. Through 2006, Levinson had been in contact with some of his former colleagues, who continued to hold him in high esteem. One in particular, a quirky woman named Ann Jablonski, was a highly regarded intelligence agent who had been giving daily intelligence briefings to then-Attorney General John Ashcroft and the director of the FBI, Robert Mueller. She was well-connected, and had always taken a liking to Levinson, whom she knew did good work. After being brought in a few times to discuss money laundering tactics with officials in the CIA, Levinson was hired by the agency's illicit finance group within the Office of Transnational Issues. This is the office that tracks money transfers, weapon smuggling, and organized crime across borders. And Jablonski helped hook up Levinson with this new gig, which promised him a change from his work in the private sector. He was contracted for about $85,000 a year to write reports which would be centered around money laundering and other crimes related to financial matters. However, it seems like Levinson, and those that hired him, knew that this job would be much more than simply writing reports. His reports weren't just simple analysis, and would require him to be much more than a typical desk jockey. He would be writing intelligence reports based on hands-on investigations that he was operating, with close to no supervision. This would require Levinson to travel to foreign nations, some of them hostile, to indirectly investigate certain matters for the CIA. This was everything from investigating money laundering between Russian investors, to learning more about the burgeoning ties between Venezuela's Hugo Chavez and the Islamic Republic of Iran. In essence, Levinson was given carte blanche to write his reports for the CIA. He was only expected to deliver a handful of reports each month, but would often deliver dozens, with his colleagues admiring his tenacity and work ethic in emails to one another, at one point referring to him as a quote-unquote gold mine of intelligence. However, his work began to blur the line between simple analysis and covert intelligence, with him conducting his own operations with close to no oversight. There was no one looking over his shoulder, just him going into foreign nations and doing what he did best, making contacts and developing informants with his friendly, unassuming nature. By all accounts, he was great at this work, but because of its very nature, it would remain secretive for several years. Not even the clandestine branch of the CIA he indirectly worked for was aware of his actions. That's how off the books he was during this time period. And that was probably the part of the job that Bob Levinson found most enticing. In an email written to his friend and colleague Anne Jablonski, the same woman that helped him get the job, Bob wrote about this new job. Quote, Today is my 32nd wedding anniversary, and aside from celebrating those years with Christine, I'm going to prematurely celebrate this. It seems like something too good to be true. I really look forward to working with you and trying to make a contribution. In the first half of 2007, Bob Levinson continued his work as a contractor, working indirectly for the CIA. He had no real mission, but was allowed to work on his own prerogative, travel the world, make connections that would point him to solid information, and then pass it on to his superiors. The CIA did not pay for his travels, but would reimburse him for all of his expenses. While in Geneva on one of these fact-finding operations, Levinson wrote an email to a friend. The subject of this email touched on a mission he was planning, to the nation of Iran, which had been deemed a black hole for American intelligence. Over several decades, the CIA had really failed to establish any solid connections in senior positions, so intelligence for the Islamic Republic was hard to come by. In this email, Levinson wrote, quote, I guess as I approach my 59th birthday on the 10th of March, and after having done quite a few other crazy things in my life, 
I am questioning just why, at this point, with seven kids and a great wife, why would I put myself in such jeopardy? As you can imagine, that question would seem extremely poignant in retrospect. On March 8th, 2007, Robert Levinson made his trip to Iran, or rather, Kish Island, a tourist hotspot just off the southern coast of Iran, known for its scenic beaches, ancient ruins, and shopping centers. Kish Island is also well known for its rather lax entry laws, which means that you do not need a visa to visit, which is very unlike mainland Iran, which is hard to access for Americans and other Westerners. Levinson had flown out of Dubai, where he had been staying in the days prior. He packed very light, throwing some clothes and toiletries in a bag, and did not even check out of his Dubai hotel. It seemed like he anticipated returning the very next day. Bob Levinson's purpose for heading to Quiche Island was to investigate a smuggling ring. In particular, he claimed that he was working on behalf of British American Tobacco, and was looking into a private matter of cigarette smuggling in the Persian Gulf. As you can imagine, this was a cover crafted for Levinson by him and his colleagues, but was rather flimsy at best. His real mission was to meet with American fugitive Dawood Salayudin, who had been born in the U.S. as David Belfield. Back in 1980, he had been involved in the shooting death of a former aide to the Shah of Iran in Bethesda, Maryland, which led to him fleeing the country for Iran. He had lived in the nation ever since, adopting his new identity and assimilating to the lifestyle there. The two men had been introduced via a mutual acquaintance, and Levinson had arranged the meeting under the guise of his cover story, stating that he was trying to learn about a smuggling ring in the region. Salyudin claims that he never knew the true purpose of the meeting, or what Levinson was hoping to accomplish by meeting him. But it has come to light in the years since that Levinson was hoping to turn the American-born Sally Uden into an informant. He had learned from their mutual acquaintance that the man had become disillusioned with the Iranian government, and could possibly be flipped. Unfortunately, Bob Levinson had made a fatal mistake in arranging their meeting. He had booked them into the same room at the Merriam Hotel on Quiche Island, where they did meet and were able to speak for several hours. However, their meeting drew the attention of Iran's interior ministry, who were alarmed that two Americans were meeting up in a hotel just off of the Iranian coast. The evening that the two men met, they were detained by ministry officials at the hotel. From there, they were each taken off to separate locations, with Dawood Salyudin spending the night in a local jail, away from Robert Levinson. Following this meeting, and his detainment by Iranian police, Robert Levinson was simply gone. He had been taken away from the Maryam Hotel by Iranian officials, but there was no record of him being held in any known facility. No jails or prisons had his name listed as an inmate, either past or present. And from this point forward, Bob Levinson's whereabouts would become a complete and total mystery. After not hearing from Bob for days, his family began to grow increasingly concerned. They began reaching out to known colleagues and friends, who might have an idea on where he was, but they seemed to be equally in the dark. Because of Bob's work, he often kept to himself and traveled solo, without much in the way of supervision. What the Levinson family found most surprising, if not alarming, was that there seemed to be no real rush to find him in the intelligence community. The CIA refused to admit that Levinson was an employee of theirs, stating that whatever he was doing on Quiche Island, he was doing of his own accord. They would refuse to have any connection to Levinson for years after the fact. Just two months later, then-Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice wrote in a cable to U.S. embassies, quote, Levinson was not working for the United States government. The FBI of whom Levinson was employed for several years, were charged with investigating his disappearance. However, due to international laws and diplomatic disputes with the nation of Iran, there was very little that they could actually do. They collected evidence, primarily stuff like Bob's personal hard drives, but seemed unable to offer much in the way of an answer. Based on the information they were able to obtain, Bob Levinson was a private citizen that had run afoul of Iran, and that seemed to be that. 
Levinson's disappearance came at a time of heightened tensions between the United States and Iran. After all, the US was in the middle of two wars in neighboring nations, both Iraq and Afghanistan. And the time period that Bob went missing came at a time where US President George W. Bush was publicly criticizing Iran. He had made claims of Iran supporting terrorism, in particular the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, as well as being responsible for blocking peace talks in Lebanon. In June of 2007, then-President Bush spoke out against the detainment of Levinson, after being asked about four other Iranian-American hostages that had been detained. He said that he was quote-unquote disturbed by Iran's refusal to provide any information, and spelled out that Levinson was a private citizen that had been detained by Iran. Speaking to the press, President Bush stated, quote, I call on Iran's leaders to tell us what they know about his whereabouts. Almost immediately after Robert's disappearance, Iranian officials refused to reveal any involvement in his detainment. They have claimed to have no knowledge whatsoever of him ever being captured or held by Iranian authorities, a claim they insist upon to this day. In the latter half of 2007, members of Bob Levinson's family were allowed to fly to Iran, where they met with Iranian officials who told them that they had no knowledge of their loved one. They were then allowed to visit the hotel where he had last been seen, and noted that the hotel registry showed that he had checked out the day after his detainment, March 9, 2007. They were even allowed to view the flight logs from the time period that he went missing, and found that no flight records existed with his name after his arrival on Quiche Island. Simply put, there existed no known record of Robert's existence following March 8, 2007. Of all of the people known to interact with Robert Levinson while he was on Quiche Island, there was only one person that could offer up any kind of rationale for his disappearance. Dawood Saliuddin, the American-born fugitive that Bob had been meeting at the Maryam Hotel. In the years since, Saliuddin has been open about his meeting with Bob Levinson, even though he claims to have never heard the true purpose from Bob himself. The two met under the guise of Bob's cover story, which was relating to cigarette smuggling in the Persian Gulf. Even though they spoke for hours, Saliuddin was unaware that Levinson was trying to turn him into an informant until well after the fact. The two had been at the hotel for several hours. In fact, they had gone to dinner shortly before their detainment, when they were both taken by Iranian police. From there, both men were detained, but transported to separate facilities. Dawood Saliuddin claims that he spent the night in a local jail, and never saw or heard from Bob Levinson ever again. He was released from custody the next morning, and returned to the hotel, where he attempted to make inquiries about the man he had been meeting. There, he was told that Bob had already checked out of the hotel, and was on his way back to Dubai. That did not seem to sit right with Dawood, and he ended up taking the story to some interested publications including the Financial Times and the Christian Science Monitor. There, he hoped to raise some interest and awareness in Levinson's disappearance, even though intelligence sources tried to caution the world that he was not a reliable source. When Robert Levinson's wife and family traveled to Iran in 2007 and 2008, Dawood Saliuddin agreed to meet with them. He told them about his meeting with their missing loved one but was unfortunately unable to tell them anything beyond what he had already told journalists. In the years since, Saliuddin has remained skeptical that the Iranian government knew what they were getting into when they arrested Levinson. He believes that it was not a premeditated action to arrest an American intelligence operative, but rather just happenstance. Speaking to reporters from Time, he stated, quote, The notion that it was some kind of brilliant move on the part of Iranian intelligence is bullshit. It was dumb luck. I've been around these guys long enough to know when they're onto something and when they get lucky. And those guys were lucky. If they were so damn efficient, they'd be able to keep their nuclear scientist alive. What had originally drawn Robert Levinson to Dawood Saliuddin was the notion that he was disillusioned with the Iranian government. That disenchantment has seemed to continue growing in the years since. 
likely due in some small part to the disappearance of Robert Levinson. In that same interview with Time, about six years back, Saliudin stated, quote, Long story short, over the years I have lost a lot of respect for the Iranian system. It relies on blunt force. Iranians are afraid of their government. The basis of their rule is not love and respect for their rulers, it's fear. It has nothing to do with religion, and everything to do with power, corruption, and enrichment. Uh, with respect to the Floridian who is imprisoned, it would be a, uh, an extraordinary opportunity for the government of Iran to make such a gesture, uh, to permit uh, uh, contact, to release him, to uh, make it clear that there is a, a new attitude in Iran, as uh, we believe there will be with the Obama administration toward uh, engagement, um, carefully constructed and with very clear outcomes uh, attempted. His name is Bob Levinson. That's right. Hillary Clinton served as the United States Secretary of State from 2009 to 2013, a time period in which she acted as America's top diplomat. What you just heard was a response from her during her confirmation hearing in January of 2009. She was asked to comment on Levinson's disappearance by Florida Senator Bill Nelson, who represented Levinson's home state and had been perhaps his most vocal proponent in Congress. In the nearly two years since his disappearance, little had been found in the way of an answer. The investigation into his case was headed by the FBI, his longtime employer, but his family continued to be the driving force in his search. They were doing their best to keep his name alive in the press, but were forced to wade through the murky waters of international politics, with a nation that the US has always had an incredibly uncomfortable relationship with. The family offered up a $5,000 reward for information leading to a resolution in his detainment, but that seemed to do very little to spark any real interest. So, in 2008, after flying to Iran the year prior, Levinson's wife and family flew to the United Nations in the hopes of meeting with some senior Iranian officials. They did meet with some officials, but then Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad refused to meet with them, offering only political platitudes to help find him in the future. This seemed to be indicative of the Iranian response to Levinson's disappearance. Total ignorance. They claimed to have no knowledge of Bob's detainment by Iranian authorities. In fact, at times, they even denied it had ever happened at all. According to them, Bob had left for Dubai on March 9, 2007, the day before his 59th birthday. And that was that. Whatever happened to him was not their fault, and they had no interest in his disappearance. In a 2008 interview with NBC's Brian Williams, Iranian President Ahmadinejad stated about Robert Levinson, through an interpreter of course. Quote, there was a claim made some time ago. Some people came over. The gentleman's family came over. They talked and met with our officials and were given our responses. I see no reason for a person who was given an Iranian visa and came into Iran, arrived in Iran through official channels, to have problems here. Our security officials and agents have expressed their willingness to assist the FBI, if the FBI has any information about his travels around the world. We have said that we are ready to help, to assist with that matter. That exact same sentiment has been carried on into the next Iranian administration, headed by President Hassan Rouhani, who succeeded Ahmadinejad in 2013. Speaking to CNN in September of that year, Rouhani stated, quote, First, you mentioned a person that I've never heard of. Mr. Levinson, we don't know where he is, who he is. Sometimes you are speaking of people who come before a court of trial, and other times there are people who disappear. It's not a clear question to put these two categories side by side. He is an American who has disappeared. We have no news of him. We do not know where he is. We are willing to help. And all the intelligence services in the region can come together to gather information about him to find his whereabouts. And we are willing to cooperate on that. This is the stance that the Iranian government would take early on, and have stuck to repeatedly over the years. They have claimed to not know what happened to Robert Levinson, even though he disappeared while visiting their country, and was last seen being detained by Iranian officials. Roughly four years would pass before any new information began to surface, with Bob Levinson's family waging a public and private battle for information against their own government, which I will get into in just a bit. 
In March of 2011, as the four-year mark of Bob's disappearance approached, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton made another public statement about this case. During a joint press conference being held with Cuban officials, Secretary Clinton stated her belief that Robert Levinson was being held somewhere in Southwest Asia. This was due to some intelligence that the State Department had received over the past six months, which according to Secretary Clinton was, quote, clear and convincing proof that Bob Levinson is alive. Let me say this is an ongoing investigation. Uh, I cannot uh, comment any further. Uh, what is important is that we work to bring uh, Bob Levinson home safely to his family in Florida. Um, his family misses him uh, dearly. Uh, he does have medical issues. Um, <clears throat> and we continue to welcome any help that the Iranian government uh, can provide in determining Mr. Levinson's uh, welfare and whereabouts so that he can be uh, reunited with his family as soon as possible. Now, we're going to pause for just a moment to hear a word from today's sponsors. In December of 2011, it was announced that the family of Robert Levinson had received proof that he was still alive, in the form of a video that they had received more than a year prior, sometime in 2010. The video shows Robert Levinson, or rather, a shell of who he once was, speaking directly to the camera for less than a minute, while Pashtun wedding music plays in the background. Robert, who appears far skinnier than when he left home more than three years prior, seems to be in good health, but pleads for the U.S. government to help him return home. To my, you know, my beautiful, my loving, my loyal wife, Christine, and my children, and my grandson, and also for the United States government. I have been held here for three and a half years. I am not in very good health. I am running very quickly out of diabetes medicine. I have been treated well, but I need the help of the United States government to answer the requests of the group that has held me for three and a half years. And please help me get home. 33 years of service to the United States deserves something. Please help me. Reports would reveal that this video had been sent to the Levinson family via email sometime in 2010. In the video, Levinson says that he had been held for three and a half years, leading to the belief that the video was recorded in the latter half of 2010. After receiving the video, the family had attempted to communicate with Robert's captors, leading to at least a series of emails the details of which have never been publicly released. Attached to the original email was a demand for the United States government to release a list of prisoners. But in an odd coincidence, none of the names listed matched up with any known U.S. prisoners. This ultimately led to more questions than answers. A U.S. official with knowledge of the hostage video would later reveal to media outlets that at least one email was believed to have come from an internet cafe in Pakistan which may or may not have been the nation where Levinson was being held captive. Nora. Can you speak about this um, the videotape from the former FBI agent, Robert mm -hmm. Levinson, that his family uh, released? They received it a while ago and have just released it. What was the, um, how has the White House been involved? Well, I, the administration obviously monitors these things. The government continues, the U.S. government, to work to find Robert Levinson and to safely bring him home. Uh, we have worked on his case since he disappeared, and will continue to do so until he is reunited with his family. A as you probably recall, Secretary Clinton said in March of this year that we have received indications that Mr. Levinson is being held in Southwest Asia. And anyone with information that might lead to Mr. Levinson's safe return should contact the FBI or his family, which has a website at uh, www dot help Bob Levinson dot com. Uh, but this is an ongoing investigation and, and that's really all I can say about it. On March 6, 2012, as the five-year anniversary of Robert Levinson's disappearance approached, the FBI announced that it was setting up a reward fund for information leading to the man's freedom, totaling more than one million dollars. 
In a press conference, the reward was announced by none other than FBI Director Robert Mueller himself. Good morning. My name is James McJunkin, and I am the Assistant Director in Charge of the FBI's Washington Field Office. I want to thank you all for uh, joining us here today as we recognize the five-year anniversary of the disappearance of retired FBI Special Agent Robert Levinson. Also here with me today is FBI Director Robert Mueller and Mrs. Christine Levinson, wife of Bob Levinson. We are also joined by many current and retired special agents of the FBI who stand here today in support of Bob and his family. Again, we thank you for being here today. I will now turn the podium over to Director Mueller. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, and uh, good morning, all. As you know, this week we mark the fifth anniversary of the disappearance of Bob Levinson from Kish Island, Iran. To the members of the Levinson family, we in the FBI share in your heartache, but we also share in your sense of hope, hope of Bob's safety, hope of Bob's health, and hope of his homecoming. We in the FBI are working every day to bring your husband, your father, and your grandfather back home to you. Bob was a special agent of the FBI for 22 years that means something to each and every one of us in the Bureau. It means something to the citizens we serve. The pursuit of justice is the bedrock of the FBI. It is our mission, our commitment to the American people. I speak not only of seeking justice against those who commit crimes, justice must also include those individuals impacted by crime, the families, and the friends of the victims, those who have suffered at the hands of criminals here at home and abroad. Bob's disappearance serves as a constant reminder of why we in the FBI do what we do and who we are sworn to serve and to protect. We often speak of the FBI family. And though he is retired from the FBI, Bob remains a member of the FBI family to this day. And his family is our family. Like all families, we stand together in good times and in times of diversity, of adversity. And today we stand together to reaffirm our commitment to Bob Levinson. We in the FBI, FBI will continue to do all that we can to ensure Bob's safe return, his safe return to Christine and their family. His safe return to the FBI family and to the country that he has served so well and so diligently for over 28 years. It's our privilege to stand with the Levinson family for as long as it takes to bring Bob home. That's why we are here to announce a $1 million reward for information leading directly to the location and the safe recovery and return of Bob Levinson. And we encourage anyone with information about Bob or his captors to contact the FBI. Now let me turn it back over to Jim for additional details. Thank you, Director Muller. As we have said, this week commemorates the five-year anniversary of Robert Levinson's disappearance. Bob, a 22-year veteran of the FBI, served as, as a special agent in the Los Angeles, New York, and Miami field offices. Bob's service to this country also included six years with the Drug Enforcement Administration. Bob is a U.S. citizen who was working as a private investigator when he traveled to Kish Island, Iran on March 8, 2007. Bob has not been seen or heard from since his disappearance, disappearance that following day. The FBI has been steadfast in investigating every lead since Bob's disappearance and we are committed to bringing Bob home to his family safely. Today, the FBI is announcing a reward of $1 million for information leading directly to the safe location, recovery, and return of Bob Levinson. I hope this reward encourages anyone with information, no matter how insignificant they may think it is, to come forward and share this information with us. It may be the clue that we need to locate Bob. In November of 2010, a video was received from the group holding Bob that shows him in captivity. 
While we believe that Bob is alive, we are concerned about his health. <coughs> we need to bring him home. The Levinson family released a video plea to the group holding Bob, asking them to communicate with the family and release him from captivity. These videos and other information may be viewed on the family website at www.helpboblevinson.com. A year ago, Secretary of State Clinton issued a statement that the U.S. government had received indications that Mr. Levinson was being held captive by a group in Southwest Asia. This includes the border regions of Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. The FBI remains committed to working towards identifying his captors. A publicity campaign is being launched this week in Southwest Asia to heighten awareness of Levinson's abduction, announce the $1 million reward, and solicit information. Billboards, radio messages, and handbills will be utilized to publicize the reward and the investigation. A confidential telephone tip line will be provided for listeners and viewers with information. The FBI will continue to follow every lead into Bob's disappearance. We have posted pictures from the video along with a composite sketch of what we believe Bob would look like after five years of captivity on the FBI website at www.fbi.gov slash Levinson. Bob will turn 64 this coming Saturday, March 10th. His family has been without him for five years and they want him back now. I encourage anyone with information regarding Robert Levinson or his captors to contact the FBI. Information is confidential and can be shared anonymously. I would now like to invite Christine Levinson, Bob's wife of over 37 years, to come up and speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you. I am Bob's wife, Christine Levinson. First, let me say how grateful I am that the FBI has offered this reward on the fifth anniversary of Bob's disappearance, which is in three days from now. Our family believe that the efforts by the FBI are the best way to successfully find Bob and bring him home safely. We also believe that Bob, as a retired FBI agent, would say the same. Knowing that Bob is being held against his will and not being able to help him has been extremely difficult for our family. There are no words to describe the nightmare. My family and I have been living every day. I never imagined that we would still be waiting for Bob to come home five years later. On January 25th of this year, two hostages were rescued by Navy, Navy SEALs in Somalia. After their heroic rescue, President Obama made the following statement, which I quote, The United States will not tolerate the abduction of our people and will spare no effort to secure the safety of our citizens. President Obama added, This is yet another message to the world that the United States of America will stand strongly against any threats to our people. Bob is a hostage. For my family, that message was reassuring to hear. I look forward to the day when the President calls me with the same good news, that Bob has been found and is coming home. Lastly, I would like to express my appreciation for the words of support and encouragement my family has received from around the world through our website, helpboblevinson.com. My children and I read every message that comes in. We hope one day soon to post the following message. Thank you, everyone. Bob is home. Thank you. In January of 2013, the family of Robert Levinson released a series of photographs that they had received nearly two years prior, in April of 2011. These photos were taken several months after the video that they had received the year prior, which showed that Bob was still alive. These photos showed an even more gaunt version of their loved one, now with long, unkempt hair and a large, shaggy beard. In each photograph, he is wearing an orange jumpsuit and is bound by chains, but is holding a series of printed messages, each of which are in stilted, broken English, including the following. Fourth year. You can't or you don't want. Help me. Why you cannot help me. This is the result of 30 years serving for USA. I am here in Guantanamo. Do you know where it is? 
Like the hostage video, these photos had been sent through email to the Levinson family, and officials were able to trace the IP address to a location in Afghanistan. However, they believed that the IP address had been spoofed by somebody else, indicating that they were more technologically advanced than simple kidnappers. Like the hostage video, officials were unable to determine where the photos were taken, which remained the true mystery. Officials in Iran continued to claim having no knowledge, as one presidential administration made way for another. However, some diplomatic cables were released by WikiLeaks, which showed that the US continued to believe that Iran was responsible for the man's abduction, and was likely holding him at their unknown equivalent of a black site. In September of 2013, it was announced that US President Barack Obama had spoken about Levinson in a phone conversation with Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, but no specific details of their conversation would ever be released. In December of 2013, it would be reported by multiple sources that, despite the insistence of the White House, the State Department, and the intelligence community over several years that Robert Levinson was not employed by the government at the time of his disappearance. He was, in fact, working for the CIA at the time. It now became public knowledge that his work as a private contractor was mostly a front. Despite him technically being employed as a contractor, his work directly benefited the Central Intelligence Agency, and the reports he authored were being forwarded to his colleagues that worked there. If you recall, as early as May of 2007, when Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice wrote in a diplomatic cable that, quote, Levinson was not working for the United States government, unquote. They had been denying the possibility of Levinson working for them or going to Iran on their behalf. Now, that was being disproven in a very public forum. In December of 2013, the Associated Press and the Washington Post both published extensive articles about Levinson's work detailing how he had gone to Quiche Island in an effort to flip a possible informant, Dawood Salayudin. The AP claimed that they had learned about Levinson's CIA connection back in 2010, but had delayed reporting the news at the insistence of the US government, who wanted to keep it quiet, perhaps for Levinson's safety. After all, this was the time period in which Levinson's family was receiving videos and photos showing that he was still alive, and being held in an unknown location but several years had passed since. In their report, AP journalist wrote, quote, The AP first confirmed Levinson's CIA ties in 2010 and continued reporting to uncover more details. It agreed three times to delay publishing the story because the US government said it was pursuing promising leads to get him home. The AP is reporting the story now because, nearly seven years after his disappearance, those efforts have repeatedly come up empty. The government has not received any sign of life in nearly three years. Top US officials, meanwhile, say his captors almost certainly already know about a CIA association. Within days of the AP story, the New York Times reported something similar, stating that they had learned about Levinson's work with the CIA back in 2007, but were likewise asked by the government to keep that news quiet for the safety of Robert and his family. This news led to quite the rise in tensions between the publications sharing the story and the White House, which expressed itself during the December 13, 2013 press briefing. In this briefing, Press Secretary Jay Carney insists that Robert Levinson was not a government employee at the time of his capture, which many consider a diplomatic way of splitting hairs. I had a couple questions about Bob Levinson. Uh, the AP has reported, based in part on documents that reporters have reviewed, that Levinson was in Iran working for the CIA. Why did the administration falsely say for years that Levinson was a private citizen in Iran uh, on a business trip? And will you continue to say that now that it's been proven to be untrue? Uh, well, Bob Levinson was not a U.S. government employee when he went missing in Iran. As there is an ongoing investigation into his disappearance, I am not going to comment further on what he may or may not have been doing in Iran. Uh, I'm not going to fact check every allegation made in the story you reference, a story we believe it was highly irresponsible uh, to publish and which we strongly urged uh, the uh, outlet not to publish out of concerns for Mr. Levinson's safety. I'm also not going to say anything that might further harm our efforts to bring Mr. Levinson home safe, which has been our goal for the six and a half years he has been missing. Since Bob disappeared, the U.S. government has vigorously pursued 
and continues to pursue all investigative leads as we would with any American citizen missing or detained overseas. We continue to be focused on doing everything we can to bring Bob home safely to his family. Uh, this remains a top priority of the U.S. government. So you see the statements that the administration made saying he was a private citizen there on private business as being the same as him being there working for Julie, the Julie, what I can say is that he was not, uh, first of all, I'm not going to comment on every allegation in that story. It's a pretty substantial uh, allegation. Uh, uh, I would say that if there's somebody detained overseas and it is published, uh, true or false, that he's working for the CIA, I think it is uh, dictated by logic that that uh, very uh, likely puts that person in greater danger. Uh, what I can tell you is he was not uh, a U.S. government employee when he made that trip. Uh, but I'm not going to get into any more detail. This is, I mean, look, I understand that this is a complicated issue. It is also very sensitive and, uh, and uh, deals obviously with uh, the safety and security of uh, and, and the life of uh, an American citizen overseas. It also uh, deals with matters that are under investigation by the FBI. So I am limited for a variety of reasons in what I can say about it. Uh, and really beyond what I've just said. Can you say what the administration believes Bob Levinson's status is currently, and can you be specific about what efforts the administration is undertaking to have him return to the U.S.? As you know, Mr. Levinson disappeared from Kish Island in Iran. In 2011, we received indications that Mr. Levinson was being held somewhere in Southwest Asia. At the time, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton publicly asked uh, the Iranian government to undertake humanitarian efforts to safely return and reunite Bob with his family uh, because the Iranian government had previously offered its assistance in this matter. Uh, more recently, obviously, President Obama raised Mr. Levinson's case in his phone call with President Rouhani. Uh, in addition to the cases of detained American citizens Saeed Abedini and uh, Amer Hekmati, Secretary Kerry has also raised uh, these three cases directly with Iran's foreign minister. And today we reiterate that same request to the government of Iran or to anyone else who might have information about Mr. Levinson's whereabouts to undertake efforts to ensure that he returns safely uh, to his family. Uh, and you know, again, this is something that we continue to raise uh, at the highest levels. Uh, and to press uh, and or, or to uh, make clear to the Iranians that uh, we seek their assistance in having him returned home and to, to express that anyone else who might have information about Mr. Levinson's whereabout, uh, whereabouts uh, undertake efforts to return him uh, back home to his family. Does the administration believe he's still alive? Uh, again, we uh, were made aware in 2011 uh, that he was in, at the time, Southwest Asia, uh, but I don't have more details on uh, or any more specifics about uh, what we know about his whereabouts. Uh, obviously, we're very concerned about him and call on uh, anyone with knowledge of his whereabouts uh, to undertake efforts to ensure that he returns safely home. Was, Steve. was Rouhani aware of the case when the President raised it with him? Uh, I'd be surprised if he weren't. I don't uh, have a direct memory of uh, that conversation or the readout I received of it to, to say with assurance, but it would be surprising since this is something going back to at least 2011 when Secretary Clinton raised this issue uh, and called on and asked uh, for Iran's help because they had offered help in the past in finding, uh, in, in helping us uh, locate and, and return him safely. Okay. So, separately, there was a high profile execution in North Korea. The knowledge that Robert Levinson was working with or for the CIA has changed things significantly for his case in the years since. For starters, it provides more context for Robert's travels to Iran. It has all but been confirmed that he was doing what he had always done, building relationships and developing informants, just on a much larger and perhaps more dangerous scale than ever before. However, this knowledge would also provide a rationale for why Iran captured him, and why they would continue to dispute any knowledge of his detainment. After all, he was in essence a spy, 
that was operating within their borders. When this information was released to the public, it caused quite a stir in the international community. Not only because this info changed the context of Robert Levinson's entire story, but because it highlighted how the CIA had been acting, perhaps recklessly, in the years after 9-11. This story showed what happened when contractors like Levinson were allowed to have free reign over their own missions, with really nothing in the way of supervision or oversight. People like Levinson had been hired as contractors, but began to blur the line between contractors, analysts, and covert intelligence agents. Typically, contractors like him would have been hired to write reports from the safety of a desk, but he was allowed to make his own schedule and operate as he saw fit, from anywhere, at any time. He would create fake identities and travel to foreign nations, with his expenses being reimbursed by CIA coffers. However, he would not have to report to any station chiefs or field offices, being allowed to gather intelligence and write reports entirely on his own. However, in the wake of Levinson's capture, things changed for the CIA. In fact, in the AP's 2013 report on Levinson working for the CIA, they referred to his disappearance as, quote, one of the biggest scandals in recent CIA history. The Washington Post article about the story, released almost simultaneously, expanded upon this. Quote, Months after Levinson's abduction, emails and other documents surfaced that suggested he had gone to Iran at the direction of certain CIA analysts who had no authority to run operations overseas. That revelation prompted a major internal investigation that had wide-ranging repercussions at Langley. Following Levinson's capture by Iranian officials, the U.S. changed its policies when it came to contractors like Bob Levinson. No longer were they allowed the free reign they had had before. Instead, they were now forced to operate within rather strict guidelines that were carefully crafted to prevent this exact thing from repeating. In the aftermath, at least 10 employees of the CIA were punished, with three veteran analysts being forced to resign. Among these three analysts was Anne Jablonski, Levinson's friend and colleague that had lured him to the contracting position he had taken in the Office of Transnational Issues. According to the Washington Post, quote, to CIA officials, it appeared that Jablonski was running a source and collecting intelligence, a job for trained operatives in the clandestine service and not analyst. In fact, the CIA's clandestine arm never knew that Levinson was on the payroll or his activities when he traveled abroad. According to the CIA's internal investigation, which was conducted in the aftermath of Levinson's disappearance, it was revealed that he and Jablonski had been working together in a relationship that was kept quote-unquote off the record. He had been instructed to email her through a personal email account and had documents shipped to her home address in an attempt to skirt any kind of supervision or oversight from her bosses at the CIA. Basically, their relationship was the antithesis of what our intelligence agencies require for agents and analysts, and that led to the relationship between the two being hidden for some time. The CIA all but admitted that this is why they disputed early reports that Levinson had worked for them, because they legitimately did not know, due to Jablonski attempting to keep it a secret. This information only came to light sometime later, when friends and family of Robert Levinson were able to read through his emails, and learn about his working relationship with the CIA. As you can imagine, the reception from Capitol Hill was anything but amused at this revelation. Sometime prior, CIA officials had testified in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee that Levinson was not working for them in any fashion when he traveled to Iran, and that was now proven to be incorrect. Some US officials even warned that deception on that scale might lead to criminal charges. And among these voices were Senator John McCain, who stated that he felt personally lied to and warned of congressional oversight over the CIA and their budget. But among the news that was released at the tail end of 2013, in a flurry of reports about Levinson's work with the CIA, came the news that his family had been paid out significantly by the agency, who had been desperate to keep this information under wraps for as long as possible. They had agreed to pay out the remainder of Levinson's contract, roughly $120,000, in addition to a $2.5 million annuity which allowed the CIA to keep the details of Levinson's employment from being aired in a public forum, and prevented the public from learning about the extent of the agency's wrongdoing that had been unfolding at the time.
In January of 2016, following a period of negotiations, the United States and Iran agreed to a prisoner swap. This was a show of good faith between the nations, who had recently agreed to a treaty which relieved sanctions on Iran while also preventing them from developing a nuclear weapon. Four Americans were released from Iranian custody, but unfortunately, Robert Levinson was not among them. Iranian officials continued to claim no knowledge about the man or his current whereabouts. Despite this resistance from the Iranian government, President Barack Obama seemed hopeful that they would consider continued cooperation with the United States in their search. After the momentous prisoner swap, which took place on January 17, 2016, President Obama spoke to the media about the still missing man, who had been gone for close to a decade. Iran has agreed to deepen our coordination as we work to locate Robert Levinson, missing from Iran for more than eight years. Even as we rejoice in the safe return of others, we will never forget about Bob. Each and every day, but especially today, our hearts are with the Levinson family and we will not rest until their family is whole again. To this day, Robert Levinson is still missing. In fact, he has been missing for more than 12 years, potentially making him the longest held captive in American history. The FBI continues to investigate his case, but due to political issues beyond their control, namely the recent dissolution of the Iranian nuclear deal by the current US administration, the likelihood of the Levinson family receiving any semblance of an answer remains unlikely. In March of 2015, the eight-year anniversary of Robert's disappearance, the FBI announced that they were raising the amount of their reward from $1 million to $5 million, an amount that continues to stand today. It is possible that someone out there knows something, and if they do, they could report that information to officials and retire early as a millionaire. The FBI believes that if Robert Levinson is still alive, he is likely in the place that he has always been, Iran. They believe that the easiest answer is the most likely one, and that he never left Iranian custody after being detained on March 8, 2007. This contrast reports from the White House and State Department, who over the years, through several administrations, have claimed to have information putting Levinson somewhere in Southwest Asia. Many in the intelligence community believe that Robert Levinson is no longer alive, having died in custody at some point over the last decade or so. After all, he was not trained to resist interrogation, and was an analyst approaching his elder years. It's not like he was a trained spy by any means. In addition, he had a number of health conditions, including diabetes, high blood pressure, and gout. In the hostage video released to the public in 2011, he stated that his diabetes medication was running low, and it is possible that the worst possible outcome has happened in the years since. After all, the family of Robert Levinson has not seen any proof of life in roughly eight years, since 2011. Despite that, the family of Bob Levinson continues to hold out hope. Despite the failings of three presidential administrations to recover their loved one, they continue to host a number of social media pages, as well as a website, helpboblevinson.com. The site has several photos and videos of Bob with his family, as well as a counter, showing just how many days, hours, minutes, and seconds that he has been missing. As of this episode's recording, that counter is closely narrowing in on 4,500 days, highlighting that, if he is still alive, Bob Levinson has spent close to a fifth of his entire life as a prisoner. Christine Levinson, Robert's wife, continues to live without her husband of more than 40 years, with whom she shares seven children and even more grandchildren many of whom have been born since Robert's disappearance. Speaking to the press several years ago, Christine stated in a message meant for her husband, quote, I will continue to do everything I can to bring you home alive. All I want is for our family to be whole again. We love you. We miss you every day. We will not abandon you. The entire family has lived up to this message and refused to let Robert Levinson's story fade away. They continue to appear on television programs every year, and have proven themselves as thorns in the side of both the Iranian government and the US State Department, demanding answers for their missing loved one. 
for whom they will never give up hope. As of this episode's recording, the story of Robert Levinson remains unresolved. Thank you for listening to yet another episode of Unresolved. If you would like to stay up to date with myself or the podcast, make sure to find us on social media. The podcast has pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so just search for Unresolved or Unresolved Pod and it should pop up for you. We also have a Facebook discussion group where I talk about certain episodes, other true crime stories, or drama in the true crime podcasting community. Last weekend was a pretty big one for podcast drama, so make sure to check out the discussion group to stay up to date. If you would like to send in an email, you could do so by sending them in to michael at unresolved.me. That's M-I-C-H-E-A-L at unresolved.me. And you could shoot any voicemails or text to 831-200-3550. If you want to find any of this information, make sure to check out the podcast website at unresolved.me. There, you could find links to everything I've already told you, as well as transcripts of each episode, a list of the sources used and music featured, and much more. I also have a blog, where I recently wrote about my struggle with depression, and a lot of you responded super kindly and positively. I really appreciate that, so thank you to everyone that did so. At the podcast website, you could also find a link to the podcast store, where you could buy unresolved t-shirts, hoodies, and stuff like that. You could also find a link for the Patreon page. I've already announced this, but I'm soon going to be starting a Patreon-exclusive series about resolved cases. It's allowing me to focus on all kinds of stuff that I never get to focus on on Unresolved. Stuff like court cases, trial transcripts, etc. It's proven to be an interesting challenge in its own right, but it's really fun and really interesting. I should have more information about that show over the next week or so, but Patreon supporters also get access to my backlog of bonus mini-episodes, which I've worked on over the past year or so. I've got some interesting stuff in there, like UFO mysteries, musical mysteries, historical mysteries, and so much more. Once again, you can find all of that on patreon.com slash unresolvedpod. Now I'm just talking too much, so I'm gonna wrap up this episode. Hope you all found this story fascinating, and I will be back next week with another interesting story. Until then, stay safe, and I will talk to you later.